Thorsten, thank you everybody for coming to the presentation. Today I'm going to talk to you about our work on vulnerability lifetimes. Uh, this work is uh, collaborative work with uh, people, good people at the Telecooperation Lab at the Technical University of Darmstadt. And in, in two words, what we did in this work, work is that uh, we de de developed an approach to estimate how long vulnerabilities remain in the code of popular uh, open source projects. And we use this approach to perform a large scale study and, and see how, how this metric varies between projects and over time. So why did we decide to look into this metric, lifetimes? Well, there have been a lot of reports uh, talking about vulnerabilities that um, were in the code for many years before they were discovered. And of course, these vulnerabilities are very important because they affect pretty much all devices and also affect devices that are not supported anymore. And um, yeah, th therefore they're very important. However, um, this practical issue is not the reason why we decided to look into this metric. Uh, we decided to look into this metric be because we believed that it would uh, be able to, to give us some indicators of quality um, for software. For example, to see how this metric varies between different projects that use different approaches um, to develop code and so on, and to see if we're doing better uh, over time. And the good thing about this metric, for example, in comparison to the number of bugs discovered, is that it is less biased, and so we had great hope uh, to look into it. Okay, and uh, now what exactly um, do we want to measure? So this is um, uh, the classic vulnerability lifecycle, the different stages a vulnerability goes through uh, from the point it is introduced into the code, for example, via a commit in a version control system, then it is found or discovered by a party. So if this party is malicious, then uh, the exploitations can start right away. At some point, and especially for free software projects, uh, it's very usual that the vulnerability is publicly disclosed and a fix is made available uh, usually at the same time uh, if correct processes are followed. And then the patching process begins and uh, hosts are patched uh, uh, over time. So what, what we uh, are measuring in this paper is the time that a vulnerability remains in the upstream code of a project. So the time uh, between its introduction and the fix being available. When we're talking about a version control system, this time is the time between uh, vulnerability contributing commit or VCC and the fixing commit that fixes the problem. And in the case where there are multiple uh, VCCs and fixing commits, we take the time between the first VCC and the last fixing commit. And uh, we explain in the paper why, why this makes sense. So, um, as I explained before, uh, it's just a matter of, you know, having one date, another date, and calculating uh, the time that has passed between those two dates. So why, why is the challenge to, to measure vulnerability lifetimes? Well, uh, while uh, the, we know the fixing commits for vulnerabilities that are fixed and published. This information is almost always available in the CVE entries or uh, security uh, advisories and so on. Uh, we don't have information on the vulnerability contributing commits, so the commits that actually introduce the vulnerability. We only have this information for um, a small subset of vulnerabilities, and we have it because a lot of people have performed manual uh, efforts and so on to, to give this information, for example, for some vulnerabilities of the Linux kernel. Now, if there was a magic way to go from a fixing commit to the vulnerability contributing commit uh, automatically, then we would have uh, solved our problem and we would be able to perform the measurement. However, this is seemingly impossible and at, at least very difficult. However, there was a paper in 2015 that tried to do this for another reason, and I have an example uh, fixing commit for a CVE I found, a um, very recent one affecting the Linux kernel. So green lines are added lines in the fix, and red lines are deleted lines in the fix. 
And um, what, what these guys did was to develop a heuristic that would go from the fixing commit and try to find the vulnerability contributing commit. So what they did is they blamed each um, line that was deleted in the fix. So git blame finds the commit that last changed the line that we're talking about. And so they did this for each deleted line and uh, increased the blame counter by one. And they also did this for each line before and after each added block of code of two or more lines, as you see in this example. Okay? Then um, they counted the number of blames each commit received and the commit with the most blames, so the commit that changed last the most lines that were either deleted uh, or were uh, above or below added blocks in the fixing commit, then this is the VCC, okay? And they did um, a manual check uh, of, this, uh, of the result of this heuristic and they found that it performs uh, really well with 96% accuracy. So we can use this for our approach. But uh, actually when we um, compared the accuracy, when we calculated the accuracy using ground truth data or data that um, we found of much, uh, of very high quality from, the, uh, Linux, from Linux developers and the Ubuntu security team, we found that for the same uh, data set, uh, this approach only yields 40% accuracy. So it's not, uh, we cannot readily use it to go forward with our measurement. So how did we do it at, uh, at the end? We noticed that we don't necessarily need to pinpoint the VCC, we just need to estimate the commit date. So instead of getting the commit with the most blames, we did a weighted average on the commits, on the ages of the commit, commits, based on the number of blames each commit received. Yeah, so BI is the number of blames, DI is the date of the commit, and we just use an arbitrary reference date in this calculation. Um, okay, so with this approach, um, our approach achieves relatively low mean error. So the absolute value of the mean error is uh, relatively low compared to the lower bound approach by Liam Paxson in the work, and also is low compared to the um, absolute value of the lifetime. However, the standard deviation is very high. So an individual measurement uh, is prone to, to be far away from the mean and therefore uh, we cannot really use it to make uh, confident measurements. Okay, so here comes our second observation that uh, we don't necessarily care about individual vulnerabilities. This allows us to uh, get the mean of a, of a number of samples together, and as we know from the central limit theorem, this will reduce the um, uh, standard deviation variance of this mean. So if we get, for example, 20 samples together and estimate their uh, lifetime, then we can get a 95% confidence interval of plus minus 395 days. So we decided to move forward and only consider uh, samples like samples that are the result of um, averaging of the lifetimes of more than 20 vulnerabilities. So we saw that uh, we can have a heuristic that tries to estimate lifetimes and this has relatively a low mean error and with a trick we can also proceed and make uh, confident measurements. However, we also need to see if the heuristic is good enough in practice. So trying to perform tasks similar to what we want to do. Here, for example, we plot the uh, lifetime for ground truth data for the Linux kernel per year of fixing commits. So this is the, or the orange and the lifetime returned by the heuristic. And uh, we see that the heuristic performs very well. So this is um, only for the CVEs that we have ground truth data for. And for the same CVEs, we also compute the lifetime through the heuristic. We can also see that the heuristic performs very well uh, in um, generating a very similar um, distribution to the one of the ground truth data. And um, so we can proceed now with our, with our measurement. We are pretty confident that uh, what the heuristic generates is close enough to the truth that is uh, usable. Okay, so now we proceed. We have um, a data set of 11 popular free software projects 
and multiple sources to get vulnerability contributing commits and so on. And we have uh, a limited data set of ground truth CVEs and many more with known fixing commit that we apply our heuristic on. And I'm going to show you a couple of results. So first of all, here we have the computed lifetimes, the average and median for all 11 projects. And we can make some observations. Vulnerabilities live in the code generally for many years. And there are great variations between projects. For example, you can check Chromium and PHP here and that the lifetime is very, very uh, different. And uh, it's interesting to, to think what this means. Does it mean that, for example, the security of Chrome is so much better than the security of PHP that they take them uh, 10 years to find vulnerabilities? Of course, this is not the case, but we'll discuss about it in a bit. And one of the main things that affects this uh, great uh, divide between the two projects in the previous example is that of course, vulnerability lifetimes depend a lot on the code age. So for example, if you have a project that's five years old, then you cannot have vulnerabilities that have lived for more than five years. And it's interesting here to, to see the relation between the lifetime of vulnerabilities and the age of the code. So here, when we say regular code age, it is just um, the age of all the commits in a code base in a given date so 1st of July of each year. And uh, we can make some interesting observations. For, first, as we expect, the lifetime is somehow correlated to the um, code age at the time of the fix. But there are two interesting metrics that we can identify here. First, the spread between regular code age and lifetime. So this gives us an intuition of whether vulnerabilities are located in generally newer or older parts of the code. And second, the rate of change of this spread, which gives us an indication of evolution and how we're doing moving on. OK, and as implications, we have discussed several things in the paper, uh, ranging from practical considerations like the duration of long-term support. We have discussed theoretical insights, and we have discussed these interesting metrics that we found. And overall, our work on lifetimes enables further research uh, on the topic. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions.